Thanks, Dale. Thanks, everyone. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. I want to thank you that we get to gather in your name uh, with your family. Uh, please uh, bless us all through this time. I pray for all the kids out at Sunday school and the high school program. Um, I pray that uh, they'll all be pushed and challenged towards you. Thank you so much for all the leaders who are out there um, caring for them and um, trying to uh, nurture them in their faith. Please bless them and may the conversations be productive and faith-filled. For us here, Lord, fill up all of us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Uh, please guide my words. May, the, may what I say uh, bring you glory. I pray that all of our hearts and minds will be brought towards what you would have us to be pondering. So challenge us, Lord. Use this time uh, to uh, make us, uh, to, to, to change the way that we think and change the way that we act. Please bless us, Lord. Thank you for all that you do. We love you, Father. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm worried about our young people. And if I've ever said a sentence that makes me feel old, that's probably it. For thousands of years, um, older people have been fearing for the next generation. Um, allegedly, um, the philosopher, the ancient Greek philosopher Plato um, whinged that uh, young people these days um, uh, were suffering from moral decay. He was worried about the, mo the morals of the next generation. But that's not what I'm, I mean at all. Oh, I'm actually quite excited here and enthusiastic here about the, um, the young people that we've got here at Springwood. Um, Haley and her team are doing a fantastic job of, of creating an environment, a, a welcoming environment, where um, they don't just reach out but also build um, young people up in their faith. And I know even more that this church is filled with godly parents um, who intentionally nurture the faith of their children and have uh, targeted faith-filled discussions uh, with their kids. And that's the most important thing that you can do um, as a parent and to, to help the next generation, for parents to be having those uh, discussions with kids. So thank you. I'm so pleased uh, that, that we're blessed uh, to have a church where, where that is what happens. But still, I'm worried about young people. I'm worried about young people because survey after survey shows us that the vast majority, vast majority of people who grow up in the church will later in life walk away from their faith. Uh, the Christian Research Association did the survey that said that of those who attended church regularly at age 11, 72% of them were not attending church in their 20s. And that's not an outlier survey. Um, so much research back comes up with similar numbers that about two-thirds of people will walk away from their faith um, in their young adult age. That's awful. That is, that's, that's, quite, that's a tragedy. Um, so to you Christian parents out there, no matter how old your kids are, uh, know that you have no more important ministry than discipling your own children. Now please know though, um, don't, get your, don't get your hopes up too much. I'm not about to give you the magic bullet solution that's going to fix that problem. Um, it's not gonna, I'm not going to suddenly make you all better parents. Um, all your children aren't going to suddenly um, know Jesus um, because of what I say now. But what I'm hoping to do though is share one promise from Jesus that can make a difference. I think that this promise from God will give you hope and will hopefully can change the way our young people and change the way we can react to the world. Before we jump into scripture though, let me tell you a story. Uh, Mark Sayers is a prominent uh, Church of the Christ minister in Victoria, um, in, in Melbourne. Uh, he pastors the church called Red, pretty weird name for a church. Um, he's written a whole bunch of books. Um, he's, 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 he's quite, um, quite, quite, quite a pr prominent and yeah, really good pastor. About 20 years or so ago, he was fairly worried about the next generation, and particularly the young adults. And he was, he was a young adult, adult himself. And he noticed that so many Christians that he'd known of a few years ago in various churches that would go around and visit were now no longer attending church anymore. And this began to bother him, and so it should. So he began his own um, informal research project where he went around and for, months, uh, for, for many months he would um, invite as many uh, non-church attending young adults just to sit down and have a coffee with him and he'd ask them the question, 
what happened? And then he would just listen to them. He'd say, look, I'm, I'm, not, here, I'm not here to try and convince you of anything. I just want to hear your story. And he said after a while, he actually didn't need to listen that hard because the same story began to be told over and over again, but with, with, with different details, but it was the same pattern um, that it hear. And the story went something like this. I grew up in the church, and I did all the right stuff. I did everything that the church asked, asked of me. Um, um, I, I went to Sunday school, youth group, Bible studies. I got baptized, took communion, volunteered in the church. I went on mission trips, served the poor, shared my faith, cast out demons, prayed for healing, heard words from God. I did it all. I was sober, modest, faithful. But despite all of that, God didn't come through for me. I was promised an awesome life, and it never happened. And then the person would share all the ways their life had fallen apart. And obviously I'm putting lots of people's stories together here. This isn't just one person. Um, uh, but they'd say, look, I, I studied for four years and never got the career that I trained for. I was sacked unfairly. Despite saving myself a marriage, I never found a Christian to actually marry. My best friend betrayed me. My sister died after years of painful cancer. My brother's in a wheelchair for life after he was beaten up. None of this is fair. Where is my blessed life, my life to the full, my protection, my awesome life that I was promised? And with this dissonance between what they felt had been promised by the church and what they actually delivered, they walked away from their faith. They felt they'd been promised one thing, but from their perspective, God hadn't delivered on what they'd been promised. So what, what Mark says concluded was that perhaps one of the reasons, and let's be clear, this is, this is only one of the reasons for a broad variety of things happening. One of the reasons that so many young people had fallen away from their faith was that, they'd be, that they had been promised an awesome life if they'd become Christian, and it hadn't happened. For those who had had happened, yeah, they were fine. But for those who had endured tragedy, they were falling away. Now, I mentioned before that I'd talk about a promise from God. Unfortunately, one of the mistakes we often make as Christians is that we make false promises in God's name. Now, we don't always do this directly. No one ever actually says, you are guaranteed an awesome life if you follow Jesus. But we can come pretty close to it. What often happens is we take verses from the Bible and for all for well-meaning purposes and probably with, with no deceit at all, we, we, we believe what we see, but we take verses that were written to people thousands of years ago and assume that we can misapply those verses to our situations, ignoring the original context and ignoring the intended meaning of the passage. Now, so one classic verse that you, you see this happen to a lot is uh, Philippians 4.13. Um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You've all seen this being taken in, in a variety of crazy ways. I've, I've seen boxers come out into the boxing ring wearing robes with Philippians 4.13 on it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So presumably what they're hoping, praying for, is that one of the all things that God will do for them is allow them, give them the spiritual gift of being able to pummel their opponent to the ground. And, well, ma 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 maybe they will. I'm not sure what their success rate is wearing the shirt versus not. Um, I was running the um, Gold Coast Marathon a few weeks ago um, and, uh, and um, I saw a, a girl wearing that shirt. I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it might have worked because she ran fast past me quite quickly. Um, pa perhaps God did give her that strength. Um, but it's the kind of verse that we take out of its original context and we try to misapply it. Basically, we're, when we take that verse out by itself, we're arguing that we can do anything with Jesus. And to be honest, it's the kind of message that works well today. In, in our cult current cultural climate, 
Um, it's a fairly popular message. It's the moral that you see in countless movies. You can do it. You can do anything. Live out your dreams. And so then we as Christians add in, oh, and I can do all things. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's a nice form of theological justification for some fairly secular thinking. Of course, if you take a closer look at that passage and look at what comes just before it, you can see that it actually isn't a promise of an awesome life where all of your dreams are fulfilled and you can do whatever you set your heart on. Check out the verses that come before this um, uh, beautiful verse, beautiful promise. Paul, uh, probably the most successful Christian leader um, ever, says, I have learned um, in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So this is Paul sharing his own experience of learning to be content. So being content is the very opposite of striving for all this awesome life and fulfilling all your dreams. He's not actually trying to say here, you can do absolutely anything. He's able to say that, you know, I've been through all these terrible experiences and some pretty good ones too. And in wh whether things are going terribly for me or awesome for me, I can be content in that situation. And the, so the best application of that passage to us today is keeping in a line with the original meaning is that if Paul could be content whether he was in a terrible situation or a great one, then perhaps we can too. It's, it's that sort of thing that... It's, that's, one of the, that's the all thing that we can do through Christ who strengthens us. We can be content in all of these environments, no matter how um, terrible or great they are. Paul could be content even though he had unimaginable suffering. It's not the kind of message we like to share, though, is it? That, hey, life might be terrible, but you can still be content in that. That doesn't bring the crowds quite as, quite as much. Uh, be content with, with what you have. The marketing industry would hate that idea, wouldn't they? Just be content with what you have. You don't need the, the latest and best of everything. And I'd suggest that this is just one example of uh, how Christians take, um, regularly take isolated verses um, of Scripture and misapply them. Often to say, um, if you follow Jesus, you can expect an awesome life. Um, there are so many verses that you can go through here, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, but just try Googling verses taken out of context sometime. Don't do it right now. Leave it till you get home. Google verses taken out of context, and you'll find there's so many. And some of them are pretty funny too. Um, but often we take them out of context quite seriously, and we remove the original meaning, and we come up with this new meaning that we want to apply to ourselves because it, it makes us happy and it gives us... Um, whatever we want it to give us. And often for, for good purposes as well. Often we, we're trying to be encouraging, but we're twisting Scripture. What I will do, though, is I'd like to point you to a different promise of Jesus in Scripture. And let, let's, let's try and take a bit of a look at what this passage looked like originally, um, what, what it meant in its original context, and see what insight this beautiful promise of Jesus offers to that issue of young people walking away from their faith. And frankly, older people walking away from their faith as well. I'm just as worried about the grey hairs um, as the, as the um, uh, fuller heads of hair. So let, let's, let's have a look. I'm going to talk about John 16. But so to have a look at that, let's have a sneak peek at, before that, John 15. Jesus, so the, the, the setting is Jesus has had the Last Supper. He's about to be betrayed and killed. Um, he's giving his final teaching to his followers before his death. So in that teaching in John 15, um, you see a, a few a choice words. Um, I'll just give you a couple of them. Um, if the world hates you, then again, in verse um, 18 and verse 19 again, this is why the world hates you. Um, verse 20, they will persecute you always. Cool. Encouraging stuff, Jesus. Um, and he goes into verse, at the very start of chapter 16. He says, reflecting what is just said in 15, all this I have told you, so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, 
In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. So what do you notice there? Lots and lots of promises of things not going well, of hard times. But strangely, it seems that Jesus is warning them about these difficult times so that they don't fall away. It seems that Jesus thinks that warning people about trouble to come will be one of the ways to help them to not fall away. Then the rest of the chapter, um, uh, chapter 16, Jesus keeps on explaining that he needs to go away, that there's going to be grief and mourning, but it will turn to joy. He's talking about his upcoming death and, and the difficult times, the disciples that will come with that. And then at the end of chapter 16, we come to this beautiful promise of Jesus, a promise that we can claim for ourselves, a promise that I think that we can just take literally the, the words today and they'll actually mean the same today as, as they did back then. I think there's no misapplication happening here. And the promise that, that, that I see from Jesus is quite simply, in John 16, 33, this promise that you can bank on is, in this world you will have trouble. Now, that's not the sort of verse that you want to sort of just focus on every night before you go to bed to help you sleep a little bit better. Um, in this world you will have trouble. But that's a fair, fair summary of the, of the teaching that Jesus had come before that. It, it, it comes, the, 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 the verses that are around it, I'll, I'll explain a bit more after, but the full verse is, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. So he thinks that there's, there's peace will come for this. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And there's a lot in that. And I'll get back to the rest of that a bit later. But if there's ever been a verse or a part of a verse that's been proven by human history, it's been this. In this world you will have trouble. As our Sunday school teachers, our Sunday school kids have just been learning over the last couple of months, um, the disciples themselves, all the early followers of Jesus, they all endured all kinds of suffering. Uh, with the persecution, whether being tortured, killed, or exiled. For them, the promise of Jesus, in this world you will have trouble, oh boy, it rang true to them. Uh, one of the um, early Christian leaders, um, Stephen, my namesake in fact, um, he was actually the first person to be killed for his faith in Jesus. Um, um, there we go, As, uh, Acts 17.57, as they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at Stephen, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Stephen knew that in this world you will have trouble. Um, it continued with the rest of the early church. Uh, the, the, very next, the very next verse, the next chapter. Um, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The early church knew in this world, you will have trouble. Um, a bit later in Acts 12, King Herod, King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James. You know James and John, two of the like, key disciples? He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. James knew, in this world, you will have trouble. I find that, that the story really bizarre, actually, that, that, that one with James dying. Because right after that, you actually see Peter having, um, being in trouble and they, and they all try and kill him. And then Peter gets this miraculous rescue story. But James doesn't. Like, James is still dead. And if you only look at the Peter story and think, oh, it's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll all get rescued like Peter and forget about the James story, you actually miss one of the key parts of Scripture, that in this world... You will have trouble. James knew it. Um, Paul, Paul was a bit of a whinger at times. Um, um, in, in 2 Corinthians 11, um, he goes on a bit of a rant. But seriously, he had good reasons for being the occasional whinger. Um, this, this is what he said. Um, and this is only one of the passages where he goes on a rant about um, what, what, what had happened to him. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. 
I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Paul knew (laughs) that in this world you will have trouble. And human history outside of the Bible continues that same story. For thousands of years, there have been wars and rumors of war. Empires have fallen. Christians have been persecuted in many countries in many eras, including today. Countless believers have been prepared to die for their faith. And they have. Uh, Christians have died in the great plagues that killed millions. They knew that in this world, you will have trouble. Um, Even today, Christians in the Ukrainian army still get killed, as do Christians in the Russian, the Israelite, the Palestinian forces. Christians get killed in car accidents. They get robbed. They die at young ages from diseases and suffer in all kinds of ways. When we stop and think about the reality of the human experience, we know that this promise of Jesus might not be pleasant But it's true. We all know deep down that in this world you will have trouble. Yet all too often, we're well-meaning about it. We use Christian-sounding words, but we deny this truth by twisting Scripture out of its context to say things that we hope are comforting. Our motives are pure. Unintentionally, we make promises to, to others that God didn't intend. And by creating an expectation that Christians' lives are meant to be perfect, they're meant to be awesome, that all will go well for you in this world, that all of your dreams will be fulfilled, instead of expecting trouble, as Jesus has promised us, when tragedies come, we've set these people up to be shattered and disillusioned. I know multiple people who grew up in the church, some in this church, Um, for years, but when one of their parents died far too early, blamed God for it. They couldn't reconcile a loving God with their experience. They thought they'd been promised healing and protection, the good life, and, and to them, God just hadn't come through. And if you listen enough to the stories of atheists or, or people who are denying the faith, you'll often hear something like that repeatedly, that someone close to them died or someone close to them went through a a really terrible situation and they didn't deserve it and and how can a loving God allow that to happen? And there's lots and lots of answers to that as well. And we know that everybody dies sooner or later and we know it'll come earlier to some and later to others. Like we all know that abstractly, intellectually, but when it strikes home, especially if people have been taught that You can expect an awesome life um, if you're a Christian. And no wonder their faith falters. Yet scripture is crystal clear. In this world, you will have trouble. Now I'm focusing on this one verse of scripture. um, in John 16, 33. But the New Testament is actually filled with similar um, teaching. Um, uh, The the word trouble that that you see in John 16, 33... um, it actually, actually comes from the, the original Greek word, um, philipsis, philipsis. Now, there's a new word for you all this week, philipsis. Um, it's sometimes translated as, um, as trouble, but this word is used dozens and dozens of times in the New Testament, and it's often translated in a variety of different ways. Sometimes it's the word trouble, sometimes it's um, anguish or persecution, suffering, hardships, affliction, distress, trial, and hard-pressed depending on what the Bible translators um, thought would communicate best there, that they use those words, which are essentially synonyms of each other um, in, in, the verse, um, in, in, in various verses. So as you read through the New Testament, you'll notice a lot of talk about troubles or persecution or suffering and all these other flipses. And also, there's other Greek words um, that are synonyms as well that are occasionally used for another set of um, sufferings and, and troubles. There's a lot in the New Testament. It talks about um, these things. 
these troubles that are to come. But don't forget as well that this verse isn't only just, John 16, 33 isn't only in this world you will have trouble. Notice the bit at the start. I've told you these things, this is Jesus talking, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. So, and he's been listening to all these terrible things that are going to happen, most particularly him dying. He's been telling them all these things about all these troubles so that we can have peace. So somehow, us knowing that these troubles are coming are meant to give us peace. And in verse 1, we saw that it was meant to help us, to stop us from falling away. And then see the bit that comes after, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And that's the part that we have to remember as well. That the message of Jesus isn't just that um, you will have trouble, but that he has already overcome the world. There's a peace that can come. Let's go back to the peace first of all. There's a peace that can come from knowing that troubles are going to come. Now, I don't always get my parenting right. Uh, my, my, my kids can testify to that. Um, and all, all too often, they'll, they'll, one of them might come to me and say, hey, this terrible thing's happened, it's this, this tragedy, it's really bad, blah, 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 blah. Um, and as a parent, I, am, I try to comfort them and uh, um, listen to them. And often, though, what, one of the things that I'll say, and I do mean this as an attempt to comfort them, is, is something like, oh, yep, yep, that sucks. Um, get used to it, welcome to the rest of your life. Um, and it sort of feels like a little bit mean, but also what, what, what I'm actually trying to say is, you know what, yes, this is terrible, but this is what life is like. You can expect more of this. This won't be the only time this will happen to you. Um, this happens to me and to everybody else we know. Because I don't think we do people a favour if we give them a rose-coloured view of the world. Jesus knew that we needed to know in this world we will have trouble. And I think those um, around us <laughs> need to know that too. Um, but I also, I desperately want my kids to know that despite the troubles that come, that no matter what happens, God will be with them in that tragedy. No matter what happens, God has an eternal home that is building for them. No matter what happens, as Jesus goes on to say, take heart, I have overcome the world. He has overcome the world. In dying on the cross, Jesus defeated the forces of evil. He allowed for our sins to be forgiven. He invites us to have eternal life. He has overcome indeed. And despite everything I've been saying about there's no promises of having an awesome life as a Christian, um, and that in this life you'll have trouble, I do think... At the same time, that if you follow Jesus and live your life the way he's designed us to live, more often than not, our lives will turn out better than they would otherwise. There is, there is something about living our lives according to the creational intent that God has made for us humans, that things will generally work out better for us. Um, again, it's like in the Proverbs there, there it's, it's a general truth that... Uh, won't always happen. There will always be tragedies. But as a general rule, you can expect things to be better uh, by following Jesus. And there's a massive tension there um, that you, you can't answer with simplistic um, individual verses. God can bless us. God does bless us, and he will bless us in many ways. For many people, it will be in this world. For some, it will be in the next. But there are no guarantees for Christians of an awesome life or a pain-free living, for, for our, or our loved ones staying alive, or our career aspirations succeeding. In this world, you will have trouble. But God does tell us that we can have peace, so we can take heart, for he has overcome the world. So what do we do? What do we do when troubles come our way? Um, what do we do when you're faced with troubles, with anguish, with distress, or whatever else lipsis gets translated as? Well, we can go to Scripture. And we can see, we can focus on, on what we read there. And I'd suggest that there's three ideas that we can cling to from Scripture that'll help us in our troubles. 
we can know that despite our troubles, God will provide for our needs. He'll comfort us by being present with us. And he'll use our troubles to transform us. Or if you prefer a more memorable alliterative list, um, he'll provide for us, be present for us, and prepare us. Um, let's look at the first one first. Um, remember that verse we looked at before, that um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Just a few verses after that, we see another great promise passage from, from Paul. Um, but my God shall provide all your needs. There should be an S there. I know. Um, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. My God shall provide all your need. All of your need. We can trust God to provide for us. Now, it mightn't be all we want. It mightn't be all we hope for. It mightn't be all of our dreams. But God will provide us. We can bank on that. So, if, so in the midst of our worst troubles, we can know that God will provide for us. We can trust him to provide for us. And secondly, God can comfort us. God will comfort us because he is present with us in our suffering. We don't worship a God that's far away, just watching from a distance, laughing at our suffering. No, no, we, offer a, we, we worship a God that came down and lived amongst us and he knows what it's like to live the human life. He endured our temptation and suffering and abuse um, and he knows what those experiences are like. Remember that story in the book of Daniel when Daniel's mates, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, were thrown into the fiery furnace and they miraculously survived. They were rescued. And while they were in there, people looked in and they could see there was a fourth person in there. And there's speculation that perhaps that was actually Jesus coming down and being present with them in there. Whether, whether that was the case or not, we can know that Jesus is present with us in our troubles because Jesus has come back through the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, God, God is with us in his spirit. He is with us every step of the way, no matter how difficult things are. Um, and, so, so, and so we see that in 2 Corinthians 1, 4. Um, God comforts us in all of our troubles. We can know that God's been through much worse than we have. We can know that he's with us wherever we are. And he, can, and he comforts us. He loves us. And I know, I, 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 I can think of a time when I, when I was young and I was just absolutely um, heartbroken. And I could feel something that felt like God's arms wrapped around me. And it was just the most amazing sensation. Um, but whether you have that weird, amazing sensation or not, you can know that God is with you. And he wants to comfort you in your times of troubles. The second half of that verse is fascinating too. Because God doesn't just promise to provide for us and to be present with us, but he also prepares us. Um, uh, God who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves receive from God. There's a way in which the terrible things that we go through can actually prepare us. They can transform our lives so that we can become more useful. They equip us to serve God in other ways. Sometimes you might have gone through something that's absolutely terrible and then at some later time you may be a blessing to someone else because you can listen to their story and you, you don't go straight into judge, judging mode as so many others will because you know, yep, I know, I know what that's like. Boy, that was bad. And just that listening, that non-judgmental listening that you can do can make a difference. Maybe you can offer words of hope. So share what, what helped for you. And somehow your pain can be used as a blessing to other people. There's so many ways that suffering that we go through can transform us. You see in Romans 5.3, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and so much more. Our troubles transform us. Our troubles prepare us in countless ways. The promise of John 16.33, um, and, and I'll finish in a minute, is that in this world you will have trouble. That promise is true. But we can also know that despite our troubles, God will provide, or through, because of our troubles, God will provide our needs. 
He will comfort us. And he will use our troubles to transform us, to shape us, to equip us to serve others. He'll provide for us, be present for us, and prepare us. And despite our troubles, we are still loved by God. And we can still have joy. So when troubles come, keep trusting, keep praying, keep hoping. And to be honest, I'm not sure if I've got the balance right in this message. This is just a, it's a, it, it's a tricky line to walk between encouragement and warning. <laughs> but I think the warning, J- Jesus himself coupled it with the promise of hope, uh, the message of hope. I'm actually reminded of Jeff's message last week um, with all the um, warning of end time troubles that are to come. But what was his key message? Hope. Remember that crazy rat story about those, those rats that would die in the bucket without hope? It's our hope in God, in his provision, his presence, and his preparation that can get us through times of trouble. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. So let's thank him for that now. Heavenly Father, I would rather you give us all the awesome life. I would rather everything go well in my life and for my kids to have everything go perfectly for them and just have untold blessings on everyone. But we know, Lord, that you can use all of our pain. You can use all of our troubles for your glory. So, Lord, give us patience in our times of troubles. Give us perseverance through them all. Help us to trust in you no matter what happens. Give us hope for this life and for the next. And thank you, Lord, that you are with us through it all. Never let us forget that you love us and that you're with us always. May this encourage us all, Lord. Bless us, Father. And thank you for all that you've done. Help us always to be grateful. In your precious name we pray. Amen.